Hello, my name is Dr. Christy Mulkey and I'm the workshop coordinator for 240 Tutoring. This was supposed to be a live video in our Texas study and test prep Facebook group, but for some reason, Zoom is not letting me go live. So I am recording this video and hopefully I will be able to post that as soon as I'm done recording. So you will have the information I was going to share with you today. So I am live every Tuesday in our Facebook group at three o'clock Central Standard Time. So normally this is a live video and you can comment, but just know if you comment on this recorded video, I will be checking those comments and coming back and answering as many of those as possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. The last few weeks we've been working through the competencies of the EC through six math portion of the exam. Today we're gonna to look at the very last competency. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can follow along. All right, so hopefully you're seeing my PowerPoint now. And again, we are looking at competency six, which is the last competency of the EC36 math exam. So we are looking specifically at your test for EC36. So we're gonna take a look at those standards. And I'm gonna give you some quick tips and strategies to help you get through this exam. Now, competency six, when I've worked with teacher candidates in the past, I've talked to them about in the math portion of the exam, it's over mathematical processes. That's what it is. And this is what I call the catch-all competency. It's kind of anything and everything that could have been in another competency, but they're putting it in here. So it's looking at the logical reasoning part of mathematics, the exploring, investigating, um, using inductive reasoning. It's looking at evaluating reasonableness of a solution making connections in mathematics. It's looking at so many things. So looking at manipulatives, um, communicating math in multiple ways. There's so much here using graphs, tables, and diagrams. You'll see that in here. Knowing, again, manipulatives come up. Um, history and evolution of math. So many things in here, financial literacy, falls in this competency. So there's so many things they could ask about under this competency. It's again, what I call the catch-all competency. So we're gonna take a look at some practice problems. I'm gonna give you some strategies to help you get through those. So number 38, these all come from the ETS Texas EC through six um, preparation manual. So if you wanna look up those questions, they're there. I'm just gonna walk you through them. This one is looking at order of operations and finding student errors. So that makes it a little bit more tricky. It says a student simplifies the initial expression by applying the rule of order of operations. Which of the following best describes the student's errors when simplifying the expression? So the key here is they were applying the rule for order of operations. So if you remember that from school, that's PEMDAS. Okay, PEMDAS. And what that stands for is the order in which we do things. The P is for parentheses, so we work all parentheses left to right. Then we do exponents left to right. Then we look at multiplication and division together left to right, and then addition and subtraction together left to right. So that's what the student was applying. Now, whenever I wanna try to look for student errors, I like to work it myself. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set this up really quickly. We have three times two plus six, and that is squared minus four. All right, so I'm just gonna apply that order of operations myself. I have two plus six in parentheses, so I'm gonna work with that first. So now I've got three X, turn my little tablet here, I'll go ahead and work the parentheses. Two plus six is eight, and that's squared minus four, okay? Now, I've done the parentheses. I'm gonna work the exponent. So I'm gonna leave that multiplication three times. Eight squared would be eight times eight, 64. And I can actually remove that parentheses, minus four. 
All right, so I'm looking at, I'm gonna turn on my eraser so I can remove that really quickly for you. Eraser, right there. I've got three times 64 minus four. All right, so now work multiplication and division left to right. If I multiply out 64 times three, I'm just gonna come over here and do that really quickly. Times three, I get 12, regroup the one, 18 plus one is 19, 192 minus four, which is gonna give me 188. So that's how I work it. Now I'm gonna to compare to what the child did and see if I can't figure out the error that way, all right? Now what the student did here was instead of applying order of operations, they distributed this three, all right? So they distributed the three times the two and then the three times the six and then they tried to put that all squared. Well really what was in parentheses was squared, not the three, so we wouldn't distribute this here. So that's where the student messed up right off the bat. So it said the student added before evaluating the power of exponents. Well, they didn't add, so that's not correct. The student evaluated the exponent before subtracting. Okay, well, yes, but that's not the error. The student multiplied before simplifying within the grouping symbols. All right, so that sounds correct. The student simplified the expression from left to right. They actually did not do that. The correct answer is here, the student tried to multiply before they dealt with the grouping symbols, those parentheses. So that parentheses and exponents would have need to be dealt with first. So the correct answer here is C. Correct answer here is C. These can be tricky when you're looking for the student error, guys. My recommendation is do the math yourself and then look for the error. All right, let's move on to the next one. This one is choosing a problem solving strategy. So the word problem is a paint store is having a sale. For every gallon of paint a customer purchases, the customer will receive one additional gallon for free. Write an equation for P, the number of gallons of paint received, in terms of X, the number of gallons of paint purchased. All right says a teacher asks students to solve the word problem shown. One student, John, says the answer is two plus X equals P. Which of the following activities best, best helps John recognize his misconception? Okay, so really what we're looking at is X is the number of gallons purchased. Okay, so if we purchase one gallon and P is the number of gallons of paint received. So we basically have an input output table. All right, so here's the number we put in and we wanna know what are we gonna get? Well, this variable is the one gallon free for every gallon purchased. So basically we're taking whatever we purchased and we're timesing it by two. All right, so if we purchase one, we multiply that by two, we're gonna get two gallons. It's buy one, get one free. If I purchase two, I'm gonna multiply that by two and I'm gonna get four gallons. If I purchase five, I'm doubling it because for every one, I'm getting one free. So I'm doubling that. So times two would be 10. So let's look at these to see which kind of fits that. Creating a model. Well, a model is really more for geometry. We're actually going to create a model. That doesn't really help us with this problem. Creating a function table. That's exactly what I just did here. Input output is a function table. Using mental math. Using mental math is really good for estimation or things where there's computation we can do in our head that really doesn't help him understand the misconception here. So that's not correct. Graphing the numbers. We graph numbers after we understand patterns. So we would graph this after we understood the pattern. So that's, he doesn't understand the pattern here. So that's not correct. Our correct answer here is B. Correct answer here is B. All right, now I'm gonna move on to the next question. This one is logical reasoning, and y'all, this one's difficult. 
Um, this one requires some thinking. When you come across something like this, my strategy would be guess an answer, flag it, and come back to it if you have time, because this one takes some thought. So it says here, if both figures show, in both figures shown, the scales are balanced. Which of the following scales is also balanced? So you have to think about this. This is telling us, if we look right here, that this triangle, I always look at these to try to find one where there's a shape by itself. So it's telling us the triangle equals, or it's balanced when we have two of the cubes, okay? Or actually, I'm gonna fix that. It is a cylinder in a cube. Let me erase that really quickly. My vision's not as good as it used to be. I have to squint to see this. So it's a cylinder, which I'm just gonna draw a circle for easy drawing purposes here. A triangle is a circle and a cube or a cylinder and a cube. Now, if I look over here and I'm gonna basically take out that triangle and replace it with what I know. I know that I can replace that triangle with a cylinder and a cube. So I can now do some reduction here. I can take out one cylinder on each side. They cancel each other out. Now I also know that one cylinder is going to equal two cubes. Everybody see that? Hope you're following along here. Those cylinders canceled each other out. I have a cylinder left right here with two cubes because I took out that triangle and replaced it with what I know, a cylinder and a cube. Now I can use this information to reason through these answers. It says one cube is equal to two cylinders. Well, right here, we know one cylinder is two cubes. So we would actually need four cubes here to make that work. So A is not correct. One cube equals a triangle and a cylinder. Well, again, we know a cylinder is two cubes. So that cannot be correct. One triangle equals three cubes. Okay, so let's think about this. A triangle is equal to a cylinder and a cube up here. And we know that cylinder is equal to two cubes. So yes, a triangle could be equal or balanced with three cubes. A triangle with two cylinders. Well, we know a triangle is a cylinder and a cube, so that cannot be correct. C is your correct answer. So just, this takes some thinking and reasoning, all right? So again, that's why we called it logical reasoning up here, okay? Let's move on to the next question. It says, which of the manipulative materials would be best suitable for teaching decimal notation to the hundredths place? Select all that apply. I love to practice these because when it selects, says select all that apply, means there could be and likely is more than one answer. Now, if you know anything about decimals or place value, you know when we're looking at whole numbers, if I look at whole numbers, I can break that down and I have ones, tens, whoops, straight line, hundreds. And over here, I can have a decimal and I can break that down even further and I can have tenths, hundredths. I'm breaking that down into parts of a whole. Now, all of these operate on what we call the base 10 system. So we're always looking at tens, all right? So 10 ones make a 10, 10 tens make a 100. 10 tenths make a whole. 10 one hundredths make a, yeah, 100 one hundredths make a whole. 10 one hundredths make a tenth. So you have to look at it as this is all in the base 10 system. So I've given away an answer, all right? So if we want to teach decimal notation, a decimal square, guys, all that is, is basically when they draw a big square, and they break it into those 10 columns. Now that's not 10, but just go with it, 10 rows. And we shade parts of it just to show a decimal, all right? We can even shade whole columns if we want to. 
that's a decimal squared. So that is very appropriate for teaching decimals. It's basically taking a picture and breaking it into 10 by 10 grids and then breaking it into 100 smaller pieces. And then we shade parts of that. So very appropriate for teaching decimals. Base 10 blocks can also be used to teach decimals because we can take that 100 square and say that is one whole and then we can take those tens pieces in the base 10 and say those represent tenths. So those long skinny ones represent tenths. And then we can say the little ones, the little single ones represent hundredths. So base 10 blocks can also be used to teach decimals. Now these other ones, if you don't know what those are, tan, tan grams are ancient Chinese puzzles and they're used to come in triangles, a couple of different types of triangles, a rhombus and a square, and they're great for teaching area, fractional relationships, and congruency, but they are not ideal for teaching decimals. Then we have pattern blocks. Pattern blocks are just that. They're great for teaching patterns. They can also be used for fractions and area models and those types of things, but they're not good. Neither one of these are good for decimals because we can't break them up into 10 parts and all of this is operating on the base 10 system. And then we have geo boards. Geo boards are those boards with the little pegs on them and I'm not drawing that accurately. You use rubber bands to connect on those pegs. Those are great for teaching geometric concepts, perimeter, area, all of those things, congruency, proportion, but they're not good for teaching decimals. So the correct answers here would be A and B. Now, I threw this one in. This was one of our questions from 240 Tutoring because the prep manual did not have many questions on this competency. So I'm throwing in one more from our 240 Tutoring materials. And this one, guys, is just a famous mathematician or knowing the history of math remember I pointed that out you've got to know some of those and it says who is credited with creating much of what we consider geometry now this is one of those you're either going to know it or you don't so take your best guess and move on hopefully you can at least rule out the Americans geometry existed long before the Americans, before the Americas were even founded. So it's gotta be one of these. So you've just bettered your chances of guessing correctly. Now, if you don't know this, Euclid, and I'm gonna write his name so that you can see it, is who's widely considered the father of geometry. And he is Greek. So the correct answer here is the Greeks, not the Babylonians or the Indians. Now, here's what's helpful for a lot of this type of knowledge of math, some flashcards. You need to know some basic history, some basic famous mathematicians, those types of things, some terms. So those flashcards can be really helpful, but hopefully you can at least rule out B and better your chances. Now, as I've suggested in our past videos, you need to know these things, total number of questions and about how many I need to get correct. Know that you get no calculator and no formula chart. Here's something else I've pointed out in this video. You need to know some basic manipulatives. That's the teaching side of math. So learn what are some basic manipulatives? What are base 10 blocks? What are pattern blocks? What are geo boards? What are those and what are they good for teaching? Of course, know what the test looks like and practice your pacing. Now, lastly, if you want more information, if you want some flashcards, if you want to learn about different manipulatives, I highly suggest you check out our study guides. You'll find instructional content there, now some videos, you'll see flashcards, practice quizzes, full length practice tests, everything you need to study for your test. We also have free resources that include a diagnostic test and many other tools you can use. You can find all the videos I've done for the Texas EC36 math competencies right here in this Facebook group. And you can either scroll through the feed to find those, or you can click on the videos button tab over on the left-hand side of your screen and find those videos. 
We also have a YouTube channel and in that channel, you will see a Texas study and test prep playlist. All the videos I've recorded for this group are also in that playlist. So I highly suggest you check those out. We have now done all the competencies for the EC36 math. So if you've missed those, go check out the previous videos on the competencies one, two, three, four, and five. Next week, we're gonna move on to a different subject. If you have any questions, I know this isn't live like we would have liked it to be. If you have any questions, please drop those in the comments. I will come back and check those. And tomorrow I'll be doing office hours right here in our Texas group and I'll try to answer as many of those as I can. So again, I'm sorry this video couldn't be live. I don't know what the issue was with Zoom today, but hopefully I can be back with you live next week. But this video was recorded and you can comment and I'll check those comments. Again, I'm Dr. Christy Mulkey with 240 Tutoring and I wish you all the best. Thank you.